Welcome to Friends Congregational Church Sermons. We are an open and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome and you belong. I'm Kristen Hibbets, and I'll be introducing this week's sermon. If you enjoy this podcast and you'd like to learn more about our ministries in College Station, Texas, take a look at our website, friends Dash UCC dot org. Please enjoy this message originally recorded in 2022, reflecting on Matthew chapter 27, verses 11 through 14, and verses 27 through 37, with a message preached by our associate pastor, the Reverend Brooke Dooley. Our gospel reading for today is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, verses 11 through 14, 27 through 37. Hear now these words. Jesus was brought before the governor. The governor said, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, that's what you say. But he didn't answer when the chief priests and elders accused him. Then Pilate said, Don't you hear the testimony they bring against you? But he didn't answer, not even a single word. So the governor was greatly amazed. The governor's soldiers took Jesus into the governor's house, and they gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a red military coat on him. They twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They put a stick in his right hand, then they bowed down in front of him and mocked him, saying, Hey, king of the Jews. After they spit on him, they took the stick and struck his head again and again. When they finished mocking him, they stripped him of the military coat and put his own clothes back on him. They led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they found Simon, a man from Serene. They forced him to carry his cross. When they came to a place called Golgotha, which means skull place, they gave Jesus wine mixed with vinegar to drink, but after tasting it, he didn't want to drink it. After they crucified him, they divided up his clothes among them by drawing lots. They sat there guarding him. They placed above his head the charge against him. It read, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. This is the word of God for the people of God. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, into the hearts of your beloved and kindle within us the fire of your unending love. May my words and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So today is what is known on the Christian liturgical calendar as Reign of Christ Sunday, or Christ the King Sunday. It is a recent addition to the calendar, having only been added in 1925 following some of the events of World War I. It occurs on the last Sunday before Advent, a time when we anticipate the arrival of the Christ child. Reign of Christ Sunday is a day that calls us to anticipate a world in which the love and justice of Christ will reign, where the love that he taught us will overturn the systems that cast people to the margins. It is a day when we hope for the future, when we lament the powers which hinder that reality. It is a day when we acknowledge our responsibility to create such a world in the here and now, and to remember the one whose life was so unabashedly counter to the social order of his time that he died a violent and humiliating death reserved for those who posed the greatest threat to the power structures in place. And through his resurrection, death did not have the last word. And the love that he kindled in his life was not and could never be extinguished. November 20th is also Transgender Day of Remembrance, as Dan has noted. 
I, in solidarity, wanted to wear the colors of the trans pride flag today, but we all know I look like Bill Nye the science guy, and that's okay too. <laughs> this past Thursday evening in front of the church, a, a vigil was held in honor of Transgender Day of Remembrance, where the names were read of our trans and gender non-conforming neighbors whose lives were lost in the past year to transphobic violence, to suicide, or medical complications resulting from an inability to access safe gender-affirming care. According to the report that was read, there have been 390 reported deaths of trans and gender non-conforming people globally within the last year. These incidents are often underreported for reasons such as the person being misgendered or deadnamed in media or police reports. Deadnaming is when a trans person is called by the name they were assigned at birth rather than their chosen name, and even though it is often done unintentionally, it is harmful and contributes to the further erasure and invalidation of a trans person's identity and existence. Seven of the reported deaths from this past year occurred in Texas, all of whom were black and Latina women. Destiny Lachey, 29, in Houston. Cypress Ramos, 21, in Lubbock. Dee Dee Hall, 47, in Dallas, who died while in police custody. Zaniah Williams, 21, Houston, Texas. Maricela Castro, 39, Houston. Paloma Vasquez, 29, Houston. And Martina Caldera, 38, Channel View. Black, brown, and indigenous trans and gender nonconforming people, the majority being trans women or femme presenting, face violence, discrimination, and death at disproportionately higher rates. This statistic has remained consistent and worsened over the years, and it is because of this pattern that it is necessary to acknowledge the intersecting systems of oppression that exacerbate transphobic violence, such as housing and job insecurity, the criminalization of sex work, and access to comprehensive and affordable health care. This past year also presented an overwhelming amount of anti-trans legislation. Many of us are aware of this, some of which caused people to fear that their children might be taken from them. These systems do not exist in isolation from one another. They are part of an even deeper and shameful history of racism, misogyny, xenophobic immigration policies, and white supremacy. White supremacy cannot be reduced to biological factors related to skin color, but rather the historical creation of what fits into the category of whiteness, often encompassing gender expression, class, hegemonic beauty standards, and ultimately power. These ideologies endure as a means to protect the prescribed social order of those who have traditionally held power. They are systems that keep us divided, that hinder the health and well-being of particular groups of people, and that justify the use of violence and punitive measures in order to sustain those systems. This is a day of both celebration and lament, of hope, and a day to sit with the grief of our history to acknowledge our presence in a society that was built with a white supremacist mindset, the ramifications of which have led to cycles of poverty, racial discrimination, and violence, and some of which was and is still preached in churches, claiming that somewhere amid the pages of scripture where the Holy Creator called all things good and the Good Shepherd broke bread with the least of these, there is somehow also messages of border walls, of separate creation stories for white and non-white people, an idea that's known as polygenesis. There has been justification for enslavement and the notion that certain expressions of love are abominable. In my immigration and white supremacy class that Dan mentioned, 
I've had the opportunity to delve more deeply into these histories through sources such as Nell Irvin Painter's The History of White People and Ibram X. Kendi's Stamped from the Beginning, A Definitive History of Racist Ideas in America. Both of these works address the patterns and establishments of racial categorization primarily as a means to define who was entitled to certain privileges and who was a threat to that established order. Both books address the recurring theme of assimilation within the framework of racial categorization, that one may be welcomed so long as they can conform or live up to the standards of the group that has historically maintained power. Croy Safin contributed the chapter Wounds of White Supremacy, Understanding the Epidemic of Violence Against Black and Brown Trans Women and Femmes in the book A Field Guide to White Supremacy. He writes that the premise of respectability politics is that in order for communities of color to be treated better and gain more opportunities and acceptance in a white supremacist society, you must conform to the standards maintained by dominant mainstream society. Queers of color then, because they operate outside of this respectability standard, can be seen as a threat to political racial uplift, which can then result in ostracism and rejection and violence. The history of immigration in the United States is one that relies heavily not only on physical separation, but by spreading ideas that define particular groups of people who are seeking asylum as invading, as a threat to established ways of life or an infestation. To refer to another person as an infestation strips them of their humanity. The solution to an infestation in one's home is to call for an exterminator. And that is the power of how language works. Trans women often migrate to the United States in order to escape transphobic violence, such as Paloma Vasquez, whose picture was shown earlier. She was one of the seven women in Texas who lost her life last year. And just six months prior to her death, she had arrived in the United States seeking asylum for that very reason, only to lose her life to the violence from which she was seeking refuge. Trans women and femmes of color also experience increased violence by immigration policies that do not seek to protect them, such as trans activist Bambi Salcedo, who immigrated from Mexico to the United States, However, she did not receive the counseling or resources that would have allowed her to meet the one-year deadline to file for asylum. So therefore, after residing in the United States for 20 years, she was detained and placed in deportation proceedings where she was housed with cisgendered men. She was placed in solitary confinement after she experienced assault which has been proven to have detrimental effects for those who experience it. Eventually, she was granted a withholding of removal status, meaning that she is welcome to stay in the United States. However, she cannot be granted legal residency or citizenship at any time. Currently, Salcedo is the founder and current president of Trans Latina Coalition, an organization that advocates for trans Latina immigrants here in the United States. These are uneasy histories, and it is overwhelming to witness the enormity of this continued cycle of violence. I know that many of us woke up this morning to the news of what happened in Colorado Springs last night, where a shooter went into a predominantly LGBT-affirming nightclub and five people lost their lives and left 18 people injured. And today is Transgender Day of Remembrance. But that's part of why this day is acknowledged alongside Reign of Christ. Because we do not get to one without claiming our responsibility to the other. What is transformative about the gospel of Jesus is the intentionality with which it invalidates systems of oppression by holding space for grief and granting agency to the powerless. As Walter Brueggemann wrote in his book, The Prophetic Imagination, 
Jesus had the capacity to give voice to the very hurt that had been muted, and therefore newness could break through. Suffering made audible and visible produces hope. Articulated grief is the gate of newness, and the history of Jesus is the history of entering into that pain and giving it a voice. Trans and gender nonconforming people are beloved children of God who dare to live into the uninhibited beauty and diversity of God's own creation. They are made in the image of one who cannot be reduced to our own understandings of love. Like God made manifest in the birth of a child whose own beginning was geographically and socially marginal, trans and gender nonconforming people are a beautiful disruption to a social order that limits the fullness for which God has created us. A love that is an eschatological look into the beauty of a future where the diversity and authenticity of this queer world enriches our relationship to it and to the one who created us. On this Transgender Day of Remembrance, we honor our trans and gender nonconforming siblings not only in death, but by promising to protect them and to advocate for a world where their joy is made visible. And as much as we are called to hope for a future where oppressive systems and cycles of hatred will be dismantled, so too are we called to create it, to recognize that which has usurped this harmony that we share with God, and to do the hard work of lamenting the ways in which we have been complicit. So what do Reign of Christ Sunday and Transgender Day of Remembrance have in common? Everything. They are both days when we are called to remember, to witness to death and violence that happens when oppressive systems are challenged by something as audacious as love. The birth of Jesus and his death were marked by asylum and by violence committed in reaction to fear and threatened power. They are both days when we hope for what the world could be if we truly lived as Jesus taught us, in service to one another and grappling with the uneasiness of grace. The reign of Christ is a story that belongs on Transgender Day of Remembrance. As the late Marcella Althaus Reed wrote in the Queer Bible Commentary, the whole cycle of public humiliation, torture, Laughter and derision ends with this poor, fragile, young God dying a miserable death on the garbage dump of his city. This was a Messiah who announced a strange, queer God among those made impure and outcast by the social order of the time. A God who was more than can be expressed, who exceeds all categories of definition and control. B.K. Hipsher wrote in a chapter entitled, God is a many gendered thing, that to encapsulate God into any single gender identity or sexual expression limits the possibilities of God's manifestation in humanity. We need a trans God, one that transgresses all of our ideas about who and what God is and can be one that transports us to new possibilities for how God can incarnate in the multiplicity of human embodiments, one that transfigures our mental images from limitations, one that transforms our ideas about our fellow humans and ourselves, one that transcends all we know or think we know about God and about humanity as the Imago Dei. So to all the trans and gender nonconforming people who have been led to believe that they are anything other than a beloved child of God, I offer these words by the Rabbi Daniel Rutenberg. Your heart and your soul have the power to reflect and refract what is good and holy about the world. You are the prism through which the light of the sacred shines. So please, for the good of yourself and for the world that so desperately needs you and all of the great gorgeousness you have to offer, let it shine. Shine. Shine on. Amen.
We hope you've enjoyed this week's message. I'm Dan DeLeon, Senior Pastor at Friends Church, and I'd like to welcome you to join us for worship if you're in the area of College Station, Texas, at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Central Time on Sundays. The 11 a.m. service is also live-streamed on our YouTube channel, Friends Congregational Church, UCC. Our mission is to be united by the example of Jesus to live faithfully, love limitlessly, and serve boldly. If you'd like to support us, we have a Venmo for easy donations of any amount. At Friends UCC, no dashes, no spaces. To find out what's happening in the week ahead at Friends, visit our website, friends-ucc.org, and subscribe to our weekly newsletter by filling out the form at the bottom of the homepage. We'll keep you up to date with programs to deepen your spirituality and opportunities to get involved with the church, and we'll connect you to acts of service to the wider community. Our worship has ended, and now our service begins. Thank you for listening.